Good morning and welcome to the CHL Fertility Center. In this video, we will give you important information concerning your in vitro fertilization treatment. Doing an IVF, that means that we are going to bring together your oocytes and sperm in our laboratory, which means that we need both in the lab. To get sperm in the lab is quite easy. On the D-Day, in most cases, the main partner will do a sperm collection after a short sexual abstinence of one or two days. In other cases, we will use frozen sperm samples, either from the main partner or from a donor. To get oocytes in the lab is a little bit more complicated because we have to take them out of the ovaries. Therefore, you will be given a stimulation treatment. And there will be, in the first line, two medical drugs. The first is FSH, so this is a drug hormone which is aimed to stimulate follicle growth. And the second one is aimed to block any spontaneous ovulation. Because if that happened, all oocytes would be released into your abdomen and nobody could take them out. So oocytes have to remain in your ovary until we can pick them up. Now, the way your ovaries will respond to that treatment will be monitored by repeated ultrasound and blood testing until the follicular size, that means the diameter of these black round pictures that you can see on the ovarian ultrasound will be large enough and until the blood hormone level of estradiol will be high enough. When this is the case, you will be given a third drug, which is HCG. It is aimed to induce the last steps of uh, oocyte maturation. And about uh, 36 hours after this last single injection, you will have the egg retrieval, which is also called follicular aspiration or oocyte pickup. This will be done under anesthesia, which means that you also have to meet the anesthetist before uh, the egg retrieval. Egg retrieval will also be done under ultrasound guidance with this kind of vaginal probe. And on the probe there is the needle. The needle is connected to a collection tube and the tube again is connected to a suction pump. So during that uh, procedure the needle will get through the posterior wall of the vagina here and then come into the ovary and more precisely into the first follicle that will be there on the ovarian surface. Then, with a suction pump, we will aspirate the content of that follicle. This is follicle fluid, and with that fluid, we we'll get the corresponding oocyte. So, follicles are those ovarian structures that are surrounding oocytes. Follicles will grow under the influence of your stimulation, and at the end of the stimulation, a follicle will measure about 2 cm diameter. So it is large enough to be easily seen on the ovarian ultrasound. But the oocyte, the cell we are interested in in the laboratory, even if it is the largest cell of the human body, it only measures 0.1 mm. So you cannot see oocytes on an ultrasound, but only later on in our lab on a microscope. Now, once the first follicle has been aspirated, the needle will push, be pushed forward a few millimeters and then come into the next follicle. And so, all the follicles that have developed under the influence of your injections will be aspirated one after the other. And at the end of the pickup procedure, there will be several tubes, such as this one here. These tubes then will be put into a transport incubator which keeps them 
at 37 degrees. And then they will be brought here into the laboratory. Once we have them in the lab, we will look at these fluids under a stereo microscope to, to find your oocytes. We then will put these oocytes into a culture medium and prepare the sperm. Sperm preparation will result in a selection of highly motile and normal sperm. Now we can proceed with the fertilization procedure and therefore there are two technical options. One is conventional IVF and the other is exit IVF. Conventional IVF, which is shown here on the left part of the sheen, has been used for over 40 years now, since the first IVF baby was born in 1978. In conventional IVF, each oocyte will be put into a single drop of culture medium and then will add about 10,000 perfectly motile sperm to each drop and then let them do what they usually should do naturally in the fallopian tubes. So conventional IVF is the best option when all sperm parameters are strictly normal. If this is not the case, then we switch to the ICSI method. ICSI means intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So the aim is to introduce a single sperm directly into the oocyte using these two micro tools. But before we can use them, we have to prepare the oocytes further. Because when we take them out of your ovaries, they are not just naked cells but they are surrounded by several layers of small cells which under the microscope look like a small cloud where the oocyte would be in the middle of and this is the reason why we call them the cumulus. So in those cases where we want to do ICSI we have first to remove the cumulus using um, an enzyme which is called hyaluronidase and this enzyme loosens the connections between the cumulus cells and the oocyte. And after that treatment, the oocytes will look like what you can see on the next pictures here. Here's the oocyte. It is a large round cell. It is surrounded by uh, a transparent envelope, which is called the zona pellucida. And formally, there have been all these cumulus cells lying around. In this uh, example, however, they have been completely removed. And then we can go on with the two micro tools. On the left side, there is the holding pivot. It is aimed to hold the other side in place, otherwise it would roll around in the dish. And on the opposite side, there is the injection needle. It is a very, very small needle uh, with uh, an outer diameter of only five to six thousandth of a millimeter. So just large enough to take up a single sperm. And you can see the small point here in the needle, which is the head of the sperm. And this also shows you the size difference between this tiny little sperm and this huge oocyte. Now we have to move forward the needle with electronic or hydraulic assistance until it comes into the oocyte cytoplasm, such on the third picture here, and then we can put down the sperm directly in the oocyte cytoplasm. So you understand that using this ICSI procedure, we only need one single sperm and not tens of thousands. Now, once this procedure has been done, with all mature oocytes, we take the dish that contains the injected oocytes and put it into an incubator. Here in our laboratory, we use currently benchtop incubators. These are incubators with uh, distinct compartments so that each patient couple uh, has its own compartment. The next day, 
we call that day one, we will um, renew the culture medium. And by that occasion, we may see signs of fertilization, such as these two round pictures that you can see in the middle of the oocyte. They are called the pronucli, or PN. So this is a 2PN oocyte, which means that fertilization is going on there. It's not yet finished, because this is not yet an embryo. It is just a fertilized egg. And nobody can uh, be sure what's going to happen the next day. And this is the reason why we will not call you on day one. We will not give you any information, but we will call you uh, in the morning of day two, between 7.30 and 9 o'clock. So you should be available at that time. And at that time, uh, we will uh, tell you whether there are embryos, how many embryos there are, what quality they have, and uh, at what time you should come for the embryo transfer. Now, embryo quality is a morphological quality. Don't have any functional tests to tell you which, in, which one is the best, but we can classify them from the most beautiful to the least beautiful. So what is a beautiful embryo? It's an embryo that looks like this one here on the picture. An embryo that has already four cells on day two or eight cells on day three. These four cells should be of equal size. They should all have one single nucleus. They should be symmetrically organized. Yeah, there should not be any fragments lying around them. Fragments may occur, for instance, when one of these cells um, is dying and then becomes fragments. But fragments cannot move away from the rest of the embryo because at that time there is still the zona pellucida, the former envelope of the oocyte. An embryo may fulfill all criteria. Then we call it a grade 1 embryo. This is the most beautiful, such as this one here. Then we have grade 2 embryos. They have minor imperfections, but are still of correct quality. And sometimes there are so-called grade 3 embryos. Here's one of them. This is a heavily fragmented embryo, such as you can see here, half of its volume is occupied by fragments. This kind of um, grade 3 embryo clearly has less chance to implant. But in those cases, where we only have grade 3 embryos, we are going to use them nevertheless, at least for the fresh transfer, but not for freezing. So if the aim is to freeze embryos. We will not do that with this one here, but we will give him a certain chance by culturing this embryo for three to four additional days in the lab. And sometimes, but not really often, a um, bad looking embryo on day two keeps on developing and then reaches a stage where it becomes of sufficient quality to be frozen on day five, sometimes on day six. Now, when we call you on day two, we also give you the appointment for the embryo transfer. And before we do an embryo transfer, we have to agree on the number of embryos we should put back in your uterus. In women up to age 35, it is only one embryo. In women above age 37, we rather recommend two. Because at that time, chances of being pregnant go down. And putting back two embryos give a little bit more more chances that at least one of these embryos will implant. But if we do so, 
you also have to take the risk that both hit blood, and then you've got twins. Now, between age 35 and 37, uh, this question has to be discussed with the couple. So, from a technical point of view, the transfer procedure is a very easy procedure. There is no need for anesthesia. And on the day of the transfer, which will be day two, or if D2 is a Sunday, we'll do it on day three, the following Monday. And in some cases, we may also transfer on day five or day six, after a so-called extended culture. For the, culture, for the transfer, uh, you have to come back to our unit here with your partner. The presence of the partner is uh, absolutely necessary. Um, you will be on uh, lying on a gynecological chair. The gynecologist will introduce a speculum, such as for routine examination. Then, in the lab, we will take this kind uh, of embryo transfer catheter. It is a very, very soft catheter. And uh, with this catheter, catheter, we will take up the most beautiful embryo, or the two most beautiful embryos, out of their drops here. Then uh, give the catheter to the gynecologist who will introduce it into your uterus through the cervix, using again ultrasound, but this time, this time it is only an abdominal drop. And before, you will be told to drink water to fill up your bladder. And you can see the reason for that. Here, on the scheme, this lady has an empty bladder. And in most women, with an empty bladder, the uterus is lying down in that way on the bladder. So that there is a nearly 90 degree curve here to get into the uterine cavity. And this is not always very easy to do with such a soft catheter. But when you drink, your bladder fills up and the more it's filling up, the more it will push backwards the uterus. And then uh, the way will be straightforward. So the transfer will be much easier with a full bladder rather than with an empty one. As soon as the embryo is released in the uterine cavity, the catheter will be taken off. And then uh, immediately you can get up and go home. There are no special recommendations for the following days. You just live your normal life. In those cases, where there are additional embryos, and in those cases where these additional embryos are also of good quality, so grade 1 embryos and some of the grade 2 embryos, we can freeze them for future use. Freezing embryos, that means that each embryo we want to freeze, we put it onto such a vitrification device, one single embryo per device, then uh, the device is introduced into a straw. The straw will be sealed on both ends and then put into liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is an extremely cold medium. Temperature of liquid nitrogen is minus 196 degrees Celsius. And at that extremely low temperature, there will be no more chemical reactions in these embryos, so that these embryos will not get older anymore. They will just be out of time. And in theory, we could keep them forever. But we will not do that. We will keep them for one year. And after one year, if you still have frozen embryos stored in our facility here, we'll send you a reminder letter. And then ask you if you want to extend the storage period for another year or not. And in theory, you can extend it year by year by answering to our reminder letters up to a limit, because actually there will be a limit, and this will be uh, your 47th birthday. 
So it will be very important that we always have uh, the correct address. Now regarding frozen embryos, you have to know that these embryos do not always survive when we are warming them up. The uh, current average survival rate for frozen embryos is at 95%. So a few of them will not survive and will be lost at that stage. Frozen embryos currently have nearly the same chances to let to a pregnancy compared to fresh embryos. And the pregnancy rate um, highly uh, depends on the woman's age. So patients aged up to age 35 have the best chances with a 40% pregnancy rate per transfer. Patients between age 35 and 40, they have between 30 and 40% pregnancy rate per transfer. Women uh, above age 40 only have 20% and when they are above age 43, chances drop below 10% per transfer. Now, a few words about technical problems that may occur during this procedure. And the first problem uh, is about ovarian stimulation and especially about the way your ovaries will respond to that. And they may respond in an optimal manner, but also in a low manner or even excessively. Low ovarian response, that means that there are only a few follicles, or there are follicles that do not grow. In those cases, the gynecologist may increase the dose of the medication, and sometimes it will be necessary to cancel the cycle. High response, that means that uh, there are a lot of follicles growing together on both ovaries, and this condition may lead to the most frequent complication, which is called the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which is called OHSS. And uh, in this condition, the ovaries will considerably enlarge because of the presence of all these follicles. And these uh, large overstimulated ovaries may, in certain cases, act on the kidneys. And let the kidneys keep water and salt in your body. Now, when you keep water in your body, water will accumulate in your abdomen. This is what we call an ascites. And when there is water in your, in your abdomen, this will cause several symptoms, such as pelvic pain, bloating or nausea, rapid weight gain, few urine and dark colors, and sometimes breathing difficulties. These are the classic symptoms of the so-called OHSS. The overall uh, frequency of this condition is between 3 and 4 percent of the patients, especially among the youngest, that means women uh, under age 30, and also in patients uh, with a so-called uh, polycystic ovary syndrome and also in patients with very high uh, AMH levels. Now, if this was your case, then you get symptoms. But these symptoms usually do not appear before the last injection. It, they nearly, they um, nearly always appear after that time. So that means that you are very close to your egg retrieval. Egg retrieval will be done anyway. But if during egg retrieval uh, the gynecologist uh, notices that, that you have accumulated water in your abdomen, then the fresh embryo transfer will be cancelled. And they will ask the lab 
to freeze all embryos that are able to be frozen. And now they will wait for the time it will take for all your symptoms to disappear. Usually this is the case uh, after a couple of weeks. And then you will have frozen transfers. Now, sometimes uh, this situation can be foreseen in advance. And uh, in those uh, cases, the decision not to do a fresh transfer uh, may also be taken uh, before you have any symptoms. So far about uh, technical problems with the stimulation. The second problem um, is about the search for oocytes in the, the follicular fluids uh, that have been aspirated. And in the laboratory, we expect to find as many oocytes as the gynecologist has counted black round pictures on the ovarian ultrasound. But sometimes they are less. They are less because uh, some of these black round pictures actually were not real follicles, but only cysts. The cyst is also filled with fluid. This is why it's black on the ultrasound. But there is no oocyte in the cyst. So there may be less oocytes than expected. And in the worst case, there may be no oocyte at all. This is a very, very rare situation, but you have to know it does exist. Next technical problem is about oocyte maturity. Uh, especially in the ICSI procedure, once we have removed the cumulus cells, we will be able to see, to recognize the details of the oocytes. And there is uh, one detail which is particularly important. It is this small thing here, you can see between the oocyte and the zona pellucida, you can see it here too. This is what we call the first over, um, oocyte polar body. And oocytes, they have expelled this first polar body a couple of hours after your last injection. And only those oocytes that have expelled the polar body are considered mature oocytes they are able to be fertilized. But what if we find oocytes such as these two here? You can have a look at them and you will see that they do not have any polar body. These two oocytes are immature oocytes and immature oocytes will not be able, able to be fertilized. So they will be discarded from the beginning. The other mature oocytes will be injected. And now we expect that on average 70% of those we have injected will become embryos. And this uh, ratio is approximately all the same also with conventional IVF. It is an average fertilization rate. For you, maybe there are more embryos. Maybe all both sides become fertilized. Maybe less. And maybe none. But this is a complete fertilization failure. This is a very rare situation. The risk is between 2 and 4 percent. But again, you have to know it does exist. And then we come to the last step of the procedure and this is about what happens after the transfer. This actually is um, the moment where we may experience the most frequent technical problem from a statistical point of view. So up to that time everything went well. You had a good ovarian response. Uh, a lot of oocytes, they were mature, they had been fertilized, they were, they were good quality embryos. We did a transfer and after that she waited 
for 12 days before doing a pregnancy test, and then the result of the pregnancy test is negative. And this is the most frequent issue. Because in uh, the best age category, if you have a 40% or a bit more um, of pregnancy chances per transfer, that also means that you have about 60% of risk that the test will be negative. And this is the technical limit of the procedure. Now, you have a small overview over the whole IVF procedure. If you have any more questions, Dr. Laurent Desch and myself will remain available to answer them in a specialized consultation. We wish you a successful treatment and thanks for your attention.